is there an in increased risk of leak? Um, I guess in a reoperation. Um, and does yeah. that how would that there is? Okay. <laughs> uh, what's the mechanism of that? And then clinically, what does that mean as far as treatment going forward? Well, so there's an increased risk of CSF leak, there's an increased risk of um, hematoma formation, seroma, which is just fluid collections, because it's, it's um, you know, tissue that has been scarred that's not normal tissue anymore. Um, and uh, then if the person also has connective tissue disorder, they tend not to, they have some challenges with healing in general. Um, that said, uh, we don't see 50%. We don't we see about 10 to 20 percent increase in complications. Um, so we just, you know, take care of it. And we have a variety of uh, strategies for doing that, depending on how big of a leak and, and what has happened. Um, this is just a question that I know we get asked a lot and I want to bring it up. There's a lot of questions about lumbar puncture and its likelihood of causing CSF leaks. Um, I don't know if you could speak to that a little bit. So in patients who have had who have who have a Chiari malformation who do not have symptoms, if they don't have symptoms, then they must have good CSF flow at the base of the skull. If they have good flow, there should not be increased risk in doing a lumbar puncture as long as a large volume of fluid is not done. I wouldn't do you know, a lumbar drain or a high volume lumbar puncture in somebody with a KR, even if they were asymptomatic. Okay. It also um, speaks to, you know, epidural um, mm -hmm. uh, anesthesia for childbirth. We hear that a lot. And if the person is um, asymptomatic, it should be okay. Uh, there is not an increased uh, risk of complications with epidurals in KR <laughs> patients than in the general population. So um, that's okay. When someone's had a decompression, if they are asymptomatic um, or if, you know, the films look great, they look like normal, except for the missing bone, then they should still be able to have a lumbar puncture. And sometimes that's useful if you're trying to figure out if somebody has um, benign intracranial hypertension or communicating hydrocephalus. If someone is symptomatic uh, with a Chiari, uh, I would hesitate to do a lumbar puncture because you can make it worse. Mm -hmm. um, there was a follow-up question to something you had mentioned earlier about possibly developing hydrocephalus after surgery. Do you know what the percentage of, I, I think pediatrics, but I don't know if you could speak to adults as well, what the percentage of patients developing hydrocephalus is after a decompression surgery? So I don't think they develop hydrocephalus afterwards, I think it was underlying and always there. And then you do the decompression and um, then it, it becomes apparent uh, because the symptoms are so similar. You know, both conditions have headaches and global headaches can be uh, Chiari headaches too, you know, as in the case of this little boy, because sometimes because the cerebellar tonsils are plugging the frame and magnum and blocking the flow of fluid, people will have global headaches from a general buildup of pressure. Mm. So it's not only occipital headaches that we see with Chiari. Um, but that said, um, I think it's an underlying problem and a lot of the time, particularly in the people who have trouble with repeated CSF leaks, um, that can be the underlying etiology of that. Did Maybe I give you them? I'm sorry. You did it. <laughs> um, we see hydrocephalus in about 10% of Chiari patients, and uh, hydrocephalus to the point that we have to put in a shunt about three to five percent. Okay. So that's why we don't. That's why I strongly disagree with putting in a shunt in a Chiari patient, even if they are presenting with symptoms that seem more like hydrocephalus, even if they have big ventricles and they have a Chiari, I would always decompress the Chiari first. Because if you decompress the Chiari, you open up the fluid pathways and then everything gets better, the person has had one operation and they go on their way. If you put in a shunt, you're putting in a device that can malfunction, get infected for life. 
Yeah. And um, you still may have to decompress the carry. So I, I strongly uh, would go the direction of doing carry decompression in patients who present with hydrocephalus and carry. Mm -hmm. 